So this is where we left off last time, talking about weight gainers and weight losers. Does anybody have any questions before we start? All right, so we're thinking about location as it relates to cost. What was the thing about this transport-oriented firm? What was, what was the key thing kind of driving the model, the location model? That it was weight losing? Yes, whether it was weight gaining or weight losing. What was the other thing that was kind of driving it? You, you got some company. There was, there was a special thing that I don't want you guys to forget that this may or may not apply to every firm. There was something unique here. What was it about the firm's operations? Production costs versus distribution costs per mile? Yeah, so the procurement costs and the distribution costs are a major factor in their overall cost of production. Right, so transport costs matter. If transport costs are negligible, if it doesn't really matter, then location on that part doesn't really matter, right? So we're looking at whether, and we, we typically have both, input transport, output transport. And so now this is just uh, thinking about, well, where do we want to locate according to what our situation is? And so if we're weight loser, we locate where? Towards the input or towards the output? Input. input. So our costs were minimized at the input. And for our weight gainers, beverages, our weight goes up from one to four. So for our, our weight gainers through the production process, cost will be minimized closer to our output location. Maybe that's our Steinway piano or something historically. Okay, <clears throat> what if we have more than one product or more than one customer that's having our product and there's a location question? So we're gonna add another level of detail here. Instead of just going to locate where the output is, and we can maybe even be more specific. Now that we've decided to locate near our customers, exactly where should we locate? So suppose we've got W, X, Y, S, and Z are all possible physical locations. Here's location W. We're just using that as a reference point. One mile away, two mile away, three miles away, nine miles away, okay? At each location, these are the number of customers. <clears throat> It costs you a buck per mile to move that final product. So maybe you're delivering pizzas or something. You've got the opportunity to locate your business somewhere. Given this information, where's the best location? You gotta pick W, X, Y, S, or Z. <coughs> Z, why do you say that? Okay, so we've got a lot of customers down here. Other thoughts? I say Dennis. Yeah. Or your pathway between your two months output. Okay. Or about halfway. About halfway? And why is that important? Because then you can uh, get X and Z customers. So it's just, I don't know. So as far as getting the customers, okay. we're going to get all of them. It's oh. just a matter of how much cost there is. Okay, so we're kind of thinking cost here. Katie? We're looking at like the number of customers and then 11 towards the left and 10 towards the right. What if you split 10 so, on each one side? Yeah, if you like go at Y, you have 10 on each side. Okay, so at Y. So we got a, we got a Z, we got an S, we got a Y. Well, so try to justify in terms of Dollars. What's that, John? You got your an S? I'm on it. Yeah, just because <coughs> it minimizes the cost on, on Z as much as possible because of fees without just making X and W and Y's customers pay astronomical prices that get one way or the other. So okay. you've got your minimization, your cost back, even though know, there's no consumer at that particular point. So let's let's just put some numbers to it. Let's say we're going to sell to all of these customers and there's a transport cost of a dollar per mile. Right? The product costs what it's going to cost. It's like our four twelfths, the stem of the martini, 
right? So the, the product's gonna cost what it's gonna cost. We're just down to this transportation cost issue. Chelsea? Is it a dollar per mile per good or a dollar per mile per every? Per like good. Per yep, per good. Yeah, you can't, you don't catch all 10 people here. We're making multiple trips, so you just, you know, one pizza at a time to somebody, and we're not being able to gain that. So let's start putting some numbers to this then. Um, let's, uh, Z was the first one here. <clears throat> so if we locate at Z, what is our cost to get to the rest of the customers? It's going to be 20 plus, uh, are you, are you taking each individual customer? So we're locating our business here. Yes. Yeah, and we're going to so make one trip to get this guy, one, eight trips to get these eight people to okay. Y, and then two trips to get to W. So you people. should be 20 plus 72 <clears throat> plus eight. So how much are the, there's nobody here, so we don't have to worry about that one as much. How much is the Y one running? Eight. <clears throat> or no, that's distance nine. Sorry. <clears throat> so nine plus so be seven. seven. So we're going seven miles, right? Nine minus two. Seven, seven miles to get to one person. So it's seven miles to get to one person. So we're spending seven bucks for that guy. How about to these eight people? Forty-eight. Forty-eight. Oh, sixty-four. Sixty-four. We got nine minus eight. We're going eight miles. Buck a mile. Eight times eight. Sixty-four. Last people to get out to W. Eighteen. 18. Yeah, got it. All right. So there's our total cost. What do we got here? Nine. Uh, Eighty-nine. Yeah. All right. Let's go to S. Sixty. If we go to S. Got that one. Sixty to go to Z. Is that what I don't know? I'm, I'm rolling with what you guys tell me. So we got six. We got yeah. six miles to go. Yeah. <clears throat> we're hitting ten people, so sixty. Okay, and then we're going backwards here, picking up this person. We got just a mile to go, right? So we got one person there. How about to get to X? Sixteen. Sixteen, and finally to W. Six. Six. So what do we got here? 13, put the one up there, 83. Which location is superior? S. S. Can we do better than S? Y. Okay, which one? All right, so if we move to Y, we go how much out to here to get to Z? So at Y. So we're going seven miles, 70. And then we're going eight. And then we're going, four. how much? Four. Four. <clears throat> there we got it. So, what we found is what some of you were saying to kind of being in the middle. When we think about transportation costs, if we move off of Y, then we move that much further from all these people. So we pick up a dollar worth of cost here and save these people over here. So the best spot to be is in the middle. So this is the principle of median location. One of the biggies in location economics. We want to take up the number of people and choose the median, which is kind of weird under these circumstances, right? Because as you, you're kind of initially drawn to, wow, well, we've got 10 people over here. We better locate here. So we're not going to take the average because we could do a weighted average of distance or something. We want to be right in the middle of the customer base. So we're picking the middle because then we have minimized the travel expense because we're focusing it on transport costs either way. 
And so we can't do better than the, than the median. What if there's an even number in spots and shoot? Even, then your coin flip between the two spots if it's discrete. So yeah, if this one we had it right. With a number of customers? Right? Yeah, so we had 10 to the left and 10 to the right, so the median was right here. So if we eliminate that, then we'd, then we'd uh, we, it's a coin flip between the two. Well, and actually, it might be slightly slighted with that, depending, it, it would be weighted a little bit by the customer base, yeah. Because if it was, the, if, the, if the media, if there was a discrete choice here, then you'd want to go to where there was the most, the one that's closest with the most would be the way it would shake out. Okay, other comments? Are we assuming that every individual has the same demand in this case? Like they all yeah, the same yeah, yeah. We're just keeping it real simple, just kind of thinking. This is that appendix still. Okay, any other last comments? This yeah. is not, it's not considering any like, it's like a super fancy restaurant, it's been book ordered for like prestige or special occasion or anything. Well, this is the cost of delivery. Yeah, this is actually delivery. So this is more like delivering a pizza rather than coming to there. Although you can tell, you, the story is the same for the fancy restaurant comment of the spot where you should locate with their net price coming in, right? It works the same. Where should you set up your hot dog stand along the beach? You want to be at the median because that is the closest spot to get to your establishment. So that logic works the same way there. If customers are bearing the travel expense, you're still going to want to pick the median to get there. It'll lower their net price again. The transport costs in this situation are all procurement costs. Uh, distribution. These are distribution costs. We, we've waived away procurement in this. All right. So we got a similar concept here with some different constraints. So we're harvesting trees at import, input source A and B. And we've got to choose a location for our sawmill. Eventually, we're selling the trees overseas, and there's a physical boundary here of a port, a seaport. We've got a fixed highway here and a fixed highway here, so we've got existing infrastructure. So the question would be, where do we want to locate? If we can be at M, P, A, or B, so we could locate over here and actually ship the stuff over, ship the trees bring the trees down here, jump a ship, locate our, our harvesting um, operation there to turn them into boards. Or I can locate at the import source A, input source B. This is a little bit longer distance. This is a little bit longer distance than this one. So that's kind of a distance factor. You want to get both customers, so you're going to have to get your stuff at B. And, and these aren't customers. This is the input source, but the they're kind. I mean, you, the, the, okay. the the similarities are there. Yes. Both suppliers, one way or the other. Yes. The best price you want competition and supply. Um, we are paying for the transport. Somebody might be cutting the trees down, but we have to. This is us going to the input source, so we have the opportunity to locate our harvesting operation right here. And then we would have to bring these trees along the highway to get up to here to do it. And then we'd have to come back to the port to get up to the well, seeing, output. Seeing that other way is the same physical matter where you, you should place yourself at A or B because it's the same. So P is the spot. P is the spot, yes. And, and we're using the, the thing that's uh, a little counterintuitive is that it doesn't matter how long this distance is. So the fact, if this one's even twice as far, it doesn't matter. Because you're gonna be in the same pickle we were with the, one, with the example we just did. As you start to move this way to get closer to this guy, you're equally taking it away from here and adding cost to here. And so it's best to be right at the port. And so, that logic is why we've seen we have port cities. So we've got Baltimore, we've got Seattle, we've got other places where that is a city developed around a port. 
um, partially due to just cost minimization by firms that were shipping stuff overseas. And of course, there can be a whole bunch of other reasons that we'll, uh, that we've already talked about and that we'll talk about more. But just kind of trying to drill it down to the cost part, that would be here. Um, I have a question. Um, you mentioned something about, um, it kind of goes back to the other one that we were looking at. Um, you want me to back up? Yeah. start to change your median, yes. Because the further you are away from Z, the, if the majority are over at If Z, Z is 1,000, and everything else is eight. where does the median lie? If we lined up all, the median lies where? With Z then. At Z, yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if you imagine a bunch of little hash marks in here all tightly around, the median's the middle one, but they're all equally weighted. Right. So the median falls here at Z. So I'm you're right, as we start to put more weight one direction or the other, it will start to pull the median. Okay. And the reason for this one, that it's Y, like right in the middle, is because there's 10 on each side. 10 on each side, yeah. It always comes down to the median. And then when the median doesn't look at the distance, right. it looks more that's what's more. That's what's unique, that's what's counterintuitive about it is, I can put Z uh, 90 miles out, it won't matter. The optimal location is still Y. Right? So we're ignoring distance really with that calculation because it's just that travel distance. And if we're going to go to 10 people that are 90 miles away, that, that doesn't matter. The travel expense is still the same. And by moving off of the median, you'll still have more cost because it'll still cost you more to go the other direction. Because my customer base isn't changing. So the 10 stays the same, but if this becomes 90, all those numbers are gonna work out the same way. We do this little exercise and the median will still be the cost the, you said minimizing. Okay, I understand that. You're saying that the travel cost would be the same if it would be 90, I mean the travel cost would be more but it wouldn't change that median. Right, at the, the total, if you look at the total cost of getting to your, what do we got here, 21 customers. The cost of getting to your 21 customers is the best at Y regardless of the distances along their spectrum. So Z would change, but it wouldn't be from the minimum, is what you're saying. I'm saying if this was 90 miles, the distance from W, then it wouldn't matter. All right, so anything else on these two? Are we expecting on the exam for these? Oh yeah. As you read chapter, the appendix chapter, that stuff will, uh, and this the same examples that I'm going through here, this will be reinforcing. As you read it through with the text, you got my lecture, you got the text. Um, I think it'll all fall into place, hopefully. Are we going off the syllabus for the exam dates? Uh, no, remember I, I said that I want to do, um, I wasn't sure where, I was go I'm planning to hit part one for the first exam. So we'll see where that comes out. Yeah. I just put that as the earliest date. The earliest date. Is an international just what you said for the exam dates and stuff? I couldn't remember. Yeah, oh, you're just flipping them around? Yeah. So on your syllabus, if you want to pull it out, it's part, and I think you guys did mark it, but part one is what, which is uh, chapters uh, through five. So it'll, it, it's not going to be, I think I put, what, February 13th? That would have been the earliest day. Okay, so chapter three, clusters. So we've talked about scale economies in production, scale economies in consumption, trading economies, innovation cities. So we got this idea of um, uh, 
firms getting together or um, uh, operations being affected by there being uh, economies of scale in some part of the production process. So clustering is the grouping together of firms in general. And the two key terms, I guess, in this part here is localization economies. Um, let's see, cadence. If I take this. And then why don't you see me after? Can you, today or not? Uh, just try to stop by. Okay, so um, why? Urbanization, different industries, localization, same industries. So we got Home Depot and Lowe's close together, localization economies. Urbanization, multiple industries kind of grouping together, forming basically a city, the urbanization. John? Use of similar resources and blended up the same. Okay, good. Similar resources, not having to pull the paper over. So sharing some resources, yeah. Yeah, if we not having to just kind of pull them all together. What else? And those of you who got your book, that's fine, but on this stuff, I want you to kind of stretch yourself. So I'm not looking for just textbook answers. I want to hear what you think, right or wrong. You already, well, that's okay. What do you remember from memory then? I just, instead of flipping through looking for the answer, you well, can just, it, just talk. This is discussion time. Doesn't it the other person's market up a little bit so you can steal some market share from them? You locate closer to them if you have a supply that's good? So possibly, yeah, the two acting together might have some synergies of attracting more people. Yeah. Okay, so on the demand side, that, that could be a, a possibility. Good. So we've got shared resources, maybe some synergies on the, on the product side. So this, this is what we're going to explore, what, what goes on with clustering. So here's the four main areas of the, of the chapter. <clears throat> um, we talked about the innovation cities. What was key with that in chapter two? Innovation cities. A, a, above isolation, right? Yeah. So what, 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 what made it above, I guess, with that innovation city, the, that model? What was, what was going on that uh, created uh, a situation where basically people clustered together? Like the sharing of ideas. Yeah, the sharing of ideas, the sharing of knowledge, right? So this is the knowledge spillover is the econ word that I want you guys to know. So we talk about the spillover effect, which is an externality, right? So a, an extra benefit that's not directly related to maybe what you're doing at your company, but the sharing of ideas when you go out to, to Starbucks and meet with somebody and talk about what they're doing, and maybe that sparks an idea. So collaboration type of, of uh, issues. So here's some examples. So in some cases, it's pretty extreme. So video production distribution, Hollywood, right? LA, Hollywood area, 44% of the employment in that industry. So that industry as a whole, nation, nationwide, is all going on in that particular location. The financial services one, when I think of cluster, I think of the same state. Those are all over the country. So these, yeah, these are defining uh, multiple clusters. So there's a cluster. Oh, there's a cluster in each city. Got each it. city's yeah. got a cluster. Yep. Yep. So for example, so there's not 427,000 people working at Goldman Sachs. Right. So, yeah, we've got a cluster here, a cluster here, 
of industry-wide financial services, this is a pretty good chunk, right? 13% in New York, five, 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 let's just call this whatever, 15, just to keep some numbers easy, 15% plus 13%, 28%, so a third of the financial services industry is in these four locations. So that's pretty powerful. There's something going on that it's not just dispersed evenly across the nation. So this um, clustering stuff goes on in different areas, and so these are some of the major ones. Um, <clears throat> can you think of any other industries that you see together? I mentioned I think there's something going on with steel here in Ottawa, for instance. The, these clusters can be at a very small scale. Can you think of any examples from your hometowns or anything? Yeah, Wichita, the aircraft stuff. Which okay, they yeah. They have aircraft engines up there, but there's more than just the, like in Wichita. Um, oh, right, yeah. There's Beechcraft and Spirit and Cessna. We don't go anymore, but we're bought by Spirit. Yeah. There's like four. And it's called like the air capital. Yeah. Other ones you can think of? What do they do with the ag? Is it a, something specialized? Mm, the agriculture of the like they Okay. The Production of those or, okay. And is there multiple companies that are locating near there or is there just one big company? Okay, so then, no, that, I'm glad you brought that up. So that's a firm in isolation and they're there for maybe other reasons that we'll talk about but we're trying to think of ones where they're clustered together. Up in Des Moines, uh, Des Moines is an insurance cluster. So there are all, all the major insurance companies. And then there's other clusters, Chicago, and uh, some of these places have these insurance clusters too. But in Des Moines, um, there's a big insurance cluster. <clears throat> um, not, not close enough proximity to each other. So that's just a, more of a factor of the land and the, let's say the fertileness of the land. So they're drawn to that location rather than actually moving to that location. How about uh, wine? Northern California. Northern California, the Napa Wine Valley. So again, partially climate driven, of course, but then sharing of ideas of how you produce wine. and um, Boston. <clears throat> Boston. Boston Tea Party. I don't know if that's. I, I don't know if there's anything up there or not. Yeah, I was going to bring. They've actually are calling, isn't it, Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, kind of a new Napa Valley area. I can't remember what they called it, but kind of a wine region. It's actually gotten to the point where there's enough of them and it's got a unique taste that I don't really like that much. It's usually too sweet for my taste, but yeah, they're, they're all over the place, all these little wineries. So um, they just got accepted by the wine, whatever gurus around the world, um, similar to Champagne, the Champagne region of France gives you Champagne, true bubble, sparkling wine called Champagne is from that, from that area. And so there's a cluster of firms in France in the Champagne region. So wine is another clustering. I think some of these small breweries are probably the same way. Um, of course, trying to steer the conversation back to beer in some, in some way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When I was meeting with Greg uh, Moore, he was uh -huh. talking to me about uh, American Century, and they've got the like Plaza Towers up in up on the plaza, and uh, one of the internships that I was looking at getting last year was with Morgan Stanley and it was in the Plaza Towers but like American Century takes one and then they rent out the rest uh -huh. of the space so like their competitors are taking their space yeah yep. literally right there right next door yeah all right so <clears throat> another kind of cool graphic so this is just showing basically the same thing these are carpets and rugs, the industry. Down in Georgia, 41% of the industry is clustered right here of all the national sales. So look at the rest of the United States. We've got a little cluster over there, but a very big cluster down in Georgia. Why is that? 
all the things we're going to talk about in this chapter. Yep, that's exactly those first four things, sharing knowledge, labor pooling, sharing intermediate inputs, those are all some of the reasons why we tend to see firms group together rather than spread out evenly over the United States. <clears throat> Another one, costume jewelry. Would have never guessed it. 55% of the industry. Now, costume jewelry, that's a big industry, right? I mean, you go to any mall in town, you got the little fake diamonds and little, all that kind of stuff. 55% of the industry comes from right here. Texas has got a little bit, Florida. All right. <clears throat> so, item number one was sharing intermediate inputs. <clears throat> so, what do we th we don't know much about dressmaking, let's say. And then maybe you guys do. But let's think about dressmaking and the dressmaking process. And there's a cluster there around buttons. So what is it about dressmakers and button makers that cause location clustering? What do you think? Think about that product. You can use, like, buttons are like a big <coughs> thing that you use on dresses. Yes. Big Plus. thing, are they a big thing? They're, if you think about a garment. They're a necessary thing, but okay. is, I mean, is it something that you're necessarily brand loyal to, like, oh, this dress has that button on it, mm -hmm. or you can use each button for, you know, 500 different styles of dresses. Other thoughts? Could it be that, like, buttons attract, like, other, like, clothing companies and materials and stuff that might be used for dresses? Okay, and, and if we're thinking about, yeah, I agree. Um, they're attracting the dressmakers, right? Right. So who are these dressmakers? <clears throat> are we just a, a big old factory with a thousand people and we all wear the same dresses? What's that industry like? Very particular. Very, very, very what? Varied. Varied, lots of variety, right? Competitive? Mm -hmm. Seems like it, right? got those new shows on reality TV now, the, uh, I don't even remember what it's called, but they, they are making oh dresses and Say stuff. Yes the dress. <laughs> <laughs> Say yes to the dress. And how often does fashion change? Once every couple of years? All the time. Every day, pretty much, right? I mean, these people are on top of it. So, um, would it be reasonable, given those circumstances, to have a dress Maker make buttons. They probably don't have the means to do so. So when fashion's changing, in fact, what drives up the prices of new items if you're a clothing company? What what makes them kind of exclusive that you can charge $175 for the name brand, right? And increasing lots of supply, are they into mass production or keeping it exclusive? Right, because you want to wear something that not everybody else is wearing. It's just part of the game that's out there. And <clears throat> if they were to go out and have to make these buttons themselves for something that they're going to have a limited run of that thing, and then the next day they're working on a new project with a different set of buttons, right? It's not the same button on everything. Uh, not to be too uh, gender biased here, but ladies, can a button or buttons make or break an outfit. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think you <laughs> can. And I just wanted to go to your opinions first. But, I mean, I wouldn't say I have a savvy eye for fashion. But a lot of times, see some of those old pictures where there's just one big button and there's kind of a flowing thing or there's beading along a sleeve or whatever. So the buttons are an important part of the statement of the dress. All right. So <clears throat> we've got some intermediate inputs a button is an intermediate input the dressmaker doesn't make the buttons the button's been made and then it's purchased right so that's an intermediate input not a raw input that you're making as part of your production process what do you mean intermediate? 
So if we were the if we were a dressmaker, we could make the buttons, the fabric. So in fact, there's lots of intermediate inputs coming into the dress factory, right? Because they're just buying bolts of fabric, fabric yeah. right? But they could own the company that makes the fabric, and maybe they could save some money. But they can't save money in isolation because um, they can't the dress with the changing fashions. They'd have to make a whole bunch of them to make that work. So you mean as an intermediate, you need to take all of the different things that you need in order to make the outfit. No. It's like they're not a raw. So is it's this not primary to the dress? Uh, no, that is not what it makes. Kind of like, like, like the media, <clears throat> like almost like no, it's nothing to do with the media. <laughs> no, but it kind of makes sense though. Like you're you're supplying your consumer, but your consumer is a supplier to the general market. Okay. Almost. I thought it was more just that like it's already have to be produced somewhere else, but then you're using it in the process of making another thing. So it's not like a completely raw material. Right. Because it's already been produced, but then so it's like the good buttons. Yeah. Like a button's been produced by somebody else. And it, it actually, uh, most of the time, an intermediate good has value all by itself. It has some sort of value that can be used for multiple purposes. So take the case of a button. Somebody else could buy just the button for some other purpose, right? But it came from raw plastic and some sort of factory that made and drilled the holes and everything. So what's an example of another intermediate good? Just so yeah. Somebody give another intermediate good. Would like an ice cream cone? <laughs> we can use an ice cream cone. What would be that? What would be so? You're in the ice cream business. What's an intermediate input to the ice cream cone? The finished thing that you buy from Baskin Robbins or from McDonald's. The cone is the intermediate good. What? Did McDonald's make the cone, Max? I don't think so. No. They, they bought the cone good. from another company that is a cone oh, maker. I think Baskin that took Robbins advantage of it. Now, Baskin Robbins, Robbins could be a different story, yes. right? If they're doing the they're waffle different. style where they're taking the raw they, materials and putting it down. Then you're going to have your root cane burger buns from Baskin Robbins because they serve uh, food there, too. Because I guarantee you they don't make all of the stuff that they serve out of McDonald's. So there's lots of companies in, in, involved with providing intermediate goods. Right? We don't include those in GDP. I just gave this in principles class because we'd be double counting, right? But a button sold at Walmart in a button thing is part of GDP, but a button sold to a dressmaker to put as part of a dress for a final sale price of $150, that button all by itself wasn't part of GDP. It was an intermediate good. Would it be like a tire on a car? Tire on a car. Intermediate good. We didn't make the tire. We bought the tire from some, yeah. So it's, it's basically most of the things we do as a business. We use lots of intermediate goods. So just about, just about any of those is an intermediate good. Unless you're taking the raw materials and you are kind of the first person in the supply chain, right? If we, if we envision creating the ice cream cone, where does it come from? And we, there's a documentary thing on Netflix of, you know, where does my hamburger come from? And then they go all the way back to where does beef come from? It comes from a cow. And that cow is led into slaughter, and then it's carved up, and then a certain chunk of it is mixed with fat into a grinder, and then the grinder spits out a beef, and that beef goes to McDonald's, or goes to the restaurant. So even, even the hamburger, even the hamburger is an intermediate good. So lots of intermediate goods. All right. So... Yes, we got the pink slime <laughs> thing going on. Um, okay. You just pour it in it's and it's a So here's a picture for you with clustering. It's not intermediate. So this is close to economies of scale, but not quite. Why? This picture is kind of close to economies of scale, but it's not quite economies of scale, technically. Um, no, the concept of this going down is okay. It could be economies of scale. So that's not the problem. Economies of scale, as we increase the output, the scale of production, the average costs, 
falls in the long run, right? So we got falling average costs. Well, Why got, is this technically not economies of scale? Cost of per we got per button. And increases. But per button is average cost per button, so that doesn't bother well, me I, too I, much. I like not average cost per button. Is it because it's like not? Well, no. Uh, you're 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 raising a decent point. You're you're close to right right with what we're doing, because it's on the what are we measuring here? Firms. All right, so we've got number of firms in a cluster, right? So we're kind of looking at cluster size as we go up. So technically, it's it's very similar. It's almost economies of scale, but not quite perfectly economies of scale. But very similar concept. I just don't want you to lose sight of the fact that sometimes we're looking at number of firms rather than one firm increasing their own production. Okay? Just a little little nuance to it. So this is Stop. just like production in the industry. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of we can think of industry production. <clears throat> and we are not uh, the other point of distinction here is the average cost of the intermediate inputs, right? So our cost of the intermediate inputs are going down, not because of something I'm doing by myself as a company, i.e. buying in volume or something, but the fact that there's a bunch of us doing a similar thing. That's conceptually different, right? I don't have control over whether another firm joins the city and clusters. So it's an external thing coming into my, inter affecting my internal operations by lowering costs. An external benefit. Yeah, I'm getting an external benefit. So that, that's one distinction to, to make what here. That makes, that's not under our control. What makes it go down, though? Because like it, <clears throat> the button makers are, are uh, being competitive. So they have economies of scale in producing buttons. So the competition is what is driving the price. So if we look at the button maker, now remember, this is the number of firms clustering. This is dressmakers here. But if I look at the quantity of buttons, and I'm looking at the button firm, they have economies of scale the more buttons that they produce. Right? So their costs are going down the more buttons that they produce. And they're able to take advantage of those economies of scale when there's more firms nearby to do that. So wouldn't, I don't know, I guess it just doesn't make sense because if there was like, like an auto home Yes, it, yes it can. Yes, it can. So if, if you have a bunch of, um, let's just say fast food hamburger places or places, that, and again, this, I'm stretching things a little bit here, but if now it's back to what you guys are thinking with Z. If there's a bunch of hamburger places and the nearest frozen hamburger plant is 50 miles away and there's transportation costs, if that plant can load up a big old semi and make one trip to hit 10 restaurants here. They can offer that beef at a lower cost than some other meat producer that's 150 miles away. So is this looking more So having more firms, to, to get to your question, having more firms in one spot could lower the cost for each firm that's in that city because okay. transportation costs are lower. Does that, is this more looking at the manufacturing part of This thing? is, yes. Okay, I was looking at it more of like of the retail, yeah. No, this is this is more on the on the input supply. <clears throat> okay, so we got some trade-offs. Here's what we've been looking at: average cost falling for intermediate inputs. But maybe there's some other inputs that are heading the other direction. So competition for workers increases our labor costs. So we might have two competing elements going on when we start to cluster. So localization economies reduce the cost of the intermediate input, the whole button concept. But maybe there's other parts of our production process that are going to be increased because of them being. So now when I'm the hamburger place here in Ottawa and there's lots of competition with a limited supply of labor, then I'm paying more in labor. I'm having to lure the guy away from Burger King to come work for McDonald's and pay him $7.50 instead of $7, right? So I'm kind of, that competition could bid up the price of labor. 
All right, so we want to look at these two competing effects. So we're going to build a, a little model. Isolated fir uh, firms and the size of a cluster. Thinking about those costs moving different directions. So kind of similar to the other one we did um, in chapter two. Distribution cost and procurement cost moving in different directions. We got two costs, so it's kind of similar to that one. We've got the cost of the button, let's say, the prop cost here is I think what this example is going through. So we got one cost coming down, but we've got another cost going up. And how does that shape our total cost function? Prop cost is just prop cost is just a cost of an input. Yeah, let me just click to the next one here. <clears throat> Whatever it is, prop buttons. We've got two inputs with competing things going on. One's going up as more firms come in. Another one's going down as firms come in. So we want to know if they're going to cluster or not. Yeah, so where is that going to lead to a cluster, or does the, the fact that labor's going up mean that there's not going to be any clustering? Firms are going to disperse. Are we clustering, right? All right. Because prop costs, prop costs means we get economies of scale, right? Because as it increases more, the prop cost is decreasing, which means. Which is the intermediate good, so that cost is going good. down. Okay. And there's a cost for this. Okay, why do you say that? It's kind of like looking at the innovation city, so if those are still paid off, if not any greater than Okay, what's driving that result, uh, if up to a certain point? So first of all, we want to say, will they cluster? And then Chelsea's saying up to a certain point, but then it'll no longer be beneficial. And I want to think hard about what that pivotal point is of when they. It has to do with the profit. What's that? The profit. Profit. Got to come back to profit, right? So total cost at some point. I mean, it looks like the. No, I mean, regardless, the more people that. Okay, so we got number of firms. We got entry of firms now. This is the profit of the firm. So profits maximized here. So we stop at two. Is that the optimal point? No, because it's free. Because the more firms, the next firm, even if it's not, even if the, the one firm is not, they're not getting pushed to the firm, they're still getting for their own benefit. They're still getting profit. Okay. So if the firm stays in isolation. They don't have to worry about this, right? They're going to pay the prop costs here with one firm. So this is our isolation. Prop costs are going to be 60, and total cost is going to be 72. So the difference, we got the labor. This little guy is blocking that. But that $12 is the labor cost, right? So you always have the option to operate in isolation. So is there going to be incentive for firms to cluster? First firm comes in, and is that a good idea or not? Well, yeah, for a short period of time, you're making decreasing profit. Okay. Or until somebody else realizes it, and then it moves you down, and down, and down, and down, until you get to point E, where you're back at point A. And it was a bad decision, or? No, for that time. No, it's almost, you're, you're looking at, that point. it's almost like microeconomics, but <laughs> you're looking There's at, a lot of microeconomics, yes. So it's more than like, almost, it is. Yes, competition and economic profit in that one area. And okay, okay, good. Roll with that a little bit. What, what, what caused entry? Economic profit. Industry profit. Economic profit. How did economic profit, what was the deal going there? Their average Zero profit. Is Zero profits, okay. Yes, I tried to hammer that one. So if profits being zero are okay, why? Why are zero profits okay? Because you're covering your opportunity best at that point. You can't do anything else better, right? So one of our key things in econ is that 
we've got total revenue minus total cost gives me profit. Economists include all other opportunities in there, which means you can't do better elsewhere. So keep doing what you're doing, even if it's zero, right? So that's economic profit, which means that the firm is earning a, who remembers that one? Regular, or there's another word that's more common, normal. Yep, not nominal. It would be kind of nominal too, expressed in today's dollars, but a normal profit. So when economic profit's zero, the firm is still earning a normal profit. All right, so I like where we're going with this. So firm enters, right? And now there's two firms close together, two clustered firms, because doing that provided some sort of cost benefit. What kind of a market would this be right off the list of competition? Um, or would it be more of a perfect competition since they're all doing the same? It depends. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, when we think about the industries of perfect competition, monopoly, monopolist competition, and oligopoly. What were the defining characteristics of those? The entry of the market. Someone else is the product, whether it's different. The product, and so it was the final product, right? And so it's possible for firms to be in a cluster, but could they still be competing nationally for customers? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right? So what we're focusing in on here is cost and the benefits of clustering. So you could still be in a competitive environment on your final product and find advantages to grouping together because your real competition in the product market is not necessarily your neighbors. Are they grouping together? Or is, it could be some of your neighbors, but there, there might be thousands of, in monopolistic competition, how many sellers were there? Lots or a little or few? Like, One. Just monopolistic competition. More than many. More There's many. many. The Maybe it'd be helpful to do our uh, spectrum of competition here. These are, these are some good questions to help us think a little more deeper about these issues. Spectrum of competition. Perfect competition at this end of the spectrum, monopoly over here, right? One seller, many sellers. Then we got monopolistic competition, and we got oligopoly. One of the things that we're differentiating here is the number of competitors, which is important. So we've got many sellers. We've also got many sellers here selling a uh, differentiated product. Not different products, but differentiated. McDonald's hamburger versus Burger King hamburger, they're all just a fast food hamburger at the end of the day, roughly speaking, and are pretty good substitutes with each other in consumption. We move down here and we get to few sellers. But that's few sellers in the final product is where I was going with that. So this phenomenon could be true for oligopolies or monopolistic competition. But it's likely to be in the middle here. It's likely to be in the middle. Okay? So that's a long-winded answer, but th th those are some of the things you guys got to try to keep um, in check as we go through. So that's okay. So back to our cluster. Where do we go? E? Yeah, And then what, so what happens at E? Why do we stop at E? I'll just tell you you're right. I'll take you off the hook here. So we're gonna go to E, why? Because that's where you have your so-called normal profit if you're looking at the profit gap. That's right. All we're talking about is clustering now. Remember that. We're trying to say, why would firms cluster? Oh, because some things might have lower costs, so it might be advantageous to group together. Is there an optimal size to the cluster, or will the cluster continue to grow? What conditions would cause the cluster to grow infinitely? Uh, stable labor costs. OK, stable labor costs, right? So if there was not this increasing labor cost, then all we'd have is benefits to more and more and more and more and more, more firms. And then we wouldn't have this optimal size. So these two competing things of some costs going up due to clustering, some costs going down due to clustering, leaves us with 
some sort of optimal number of firms in the cluster. And so firms are going to say, oh, that's a good place to locate, right? Because there's, fir there's profits above and beyond opportunity cost. Oop, it's still good to locate here. Still good to locate here. They squeezed out the last benefit. And now nobody's going to enter in because now the labor costs are overwhelming the prop costs. The benefits of another firm being here have been swamped out. Those costs have been swamped out by the benefits of the, of the prop costs. Michael. So looking at um, Los Angeles with their 44%, uh -huh. um, with kind of how the, I guess, the intermediate um, inputs, with that cost going down as firms cluster, the labor is the one that's you know driving everything up as far as total cost is. The reason why there's so many of those because people are going to Los Angeles to try and find, like, I guess, so their labor costs could be raising yeah. as, as quickly. Right. We don't, uh, we'd have to do a study, and, and economists do, mm -hmm. of what that labor cost curve looks like, how flat or how steep it is. And that'll be due to some of the circumstances you were just describing. And same thing with the flatness or steepness of the prop costs. So imagine you've got one stage, maybe you guys have seen this in some of your movies or TV shows, right? It's like the same prop is being used in multiple shows. Um, those of you who have been in theater, it can be pretty expensive to build a prop for one show. And then if you can just go rent a prop, that's nice and done. That's a heck of an advantage, right? So there's lots of economies of scale with the prop production. You don't need it anymore after you've made your movie or your show, potentially. And now somebody else can maybe fit it in or tweak it a little bit to make it work. So those two things, the, the main part that we're trying to drive home here is that there's competing things going on as firms start to cluster together, which would then lead to maybe an optimal size of the cluster. Did I see another? Okay. All right, so at this point, profits are restored to normal is the last thing that I want you to take away from this. That's where entry ends. It's kind of very similar to the story we told with perfect competition. There could be short-term profits, but entry will cause those profits to be competed away. Here, the driving force, the, the extra level of detail we have is the, the competing things going on with, with the cost. All right. Yeah. So there's the normal profit of the firm in isolation was 10. I think we covered most of these here. Firms add to the cluster until the profit's back to normal. Um, is everybody okay with this graph and this graph? This is basically just taking out that normal profit and dropping it down. And that's all we've done here. We're kind of thinking of, I could be in isolation, or should I go move to the cluster? I'm indifferent if the size of the cluster's already reached this point where the benefits have washed each other out. All right, any last things on that one? Um, so yeah, let's do a little bit of this one. And then we're gonna do a, I feel like I'm burning you out here on, on lecture, so we'll do, we're will do. we gonna do a little exercise, but let's, let's get a little start on this. Okay, so, you brought up the GIS software. Um, if we have an industry that uh, might have variable demand, there could be some benefits to having a pool of labor to draw from as we need to ramp up our production or ramp down our production. So the little twist we're gonna put on here is trying to model that concept of having a pool of people that can bounce around between companies as needed. <clears throat> All right, um, we're gonna come to the same conclusion as we make adjustments on where to locate that our equilibrium condition would be that they would equalize uh, between isolated sites and wages in the cluster for our labor pool. All right, so imagine this little picture. 
We've got, did I bring my golf club? Oh, yes, I did. I can even add to the action here, all right? We don't know where we're gonna be. Good year, bad year, good season, bad season, whatever time frame we wanna think about, demand fluctuates. All right, <clears throat> what was monopsony again? One buyer, good. So just remember, monopoly is the one we all know, how we win the board game, one seller. Monopsony is one buyer. So imagine we got a single buyer of workers. We've got, we're in a small town here of, of 12 workers. The demand for labor was called a derived demand. What did that mean? The demand for labor was called a derived demand. whatever we're producing, right? So you've got the final product demand and that drives how much you can pay your resources. One of those resources being labor. So I think we did this last time, if I remember right, on Tuesday. The demand curve for labor was equal to the marginal revenue product curve. The price of the final product, so if we're producing hamburgers, how much am I gonna pay my cooks is dependent upon the price of the hamburger and the marginal productivity of those cooks. How many hamburgers can they make in an hour? What can I sell the hamburgers that they actually made? Right, the marginal revenue product or the value of the marginal product. That is what this demand curve is. And so if I have fluctuations in my final product demand, then I have fluctuations in my demand for labor. And given these circumstances of a perfectly inelastic supply, that means my wages are going to have to adjust for me to remain profitable. So I got variability in my wages. So let's bring profits back in. Labor demand is the marginal benefit of each additional worker. That's what we said here. So how do I calculate profit? What is the expected profit when I have a variable demand? Let's start with a high demand case for starters. What's the story going on here? I'm gonna hire 12 workers, 48. 48. Okay, so you got the triangle region down, why? What's the economic intuition here? That's a consumer surplus? It's kind of like consumer surplus, but think about who's the demand curve and who's the supply curve. Who's the demand curve? The, the producer, the business, yeah. right? So the business, so it's kind of like consumer surplus, it's like their but it's their profit, right? So that person brings in revenue. The fourth worker here brings in revenue to the firm given their productivity and the price that they can sell their product at. Brings in that much revenue. Market forces tell me I only need to pay that person $16. So I made that much profit on that extra worker. I'm gonna keep hiring workers until the revenue generated by an extra worker is equal to the cost of that worker. If the wages are 16, then I'm gonna hire 12 workers. And the profit that I had on that decision, which is related to output, of course, um, with the 12 workers, I'm not just trying to profit on the workers, I'm actually running a business, right? $48. So what's the expected profit if we've got a 50-50 shot of having high demand or low demand? It's still 48 either way. It's 48. Okay, it's 48 either way. So if I got a 50% chance of being here, 
then the, my triangle region, the way this graph is being shown here, is 48. So it's a coin flip. I'm going to get 48 either way. Or 48 plus 48 divided by 2, the average expected profit is 48. Okay, good, good. What's going on in the cluster? Elastic so elastic supply. We got lots of skilled workers in the cluster. The wage rate's fixed. Uh, the wage rate's fixed. The wage rate is established under competitive forces, right? So that's where the wage rate came from, is that through there being a large labor pool, a person with that type of skills is, is getting the $10. So it changes the the supply curve. So what's the variable that's changing? Rather than the wage that we're paying the workers, just the, so just the number of workers. When times are good, I hire more workers at 10 bucks. When times are bad, I hire three. <clears throat> so again, to put ourselves back into the cluster, I put up this labor churning idea. What's the idea of labor churning? Because, I mean, as people are getting fired from one place, they get hired elsewhere. Yeah. So we've got movement of labor from one company to the other. They're not having to relocate their house because we're in a cluster, and presumably they live close. So there's multiple firms that are hiring people with their type of skill set. And as one firm is doing well, maybe it's the production of a Hollywood film if we're back to L.A. or something, One's doing well, the other one's done. So it could be contract work. One production's going on, one production company has a big show that they're doing. They need a bunch of fill-in actors, they need, you know, whatever. We're running to that company, we have a contract for three months, the shoot's over, they're done, they're unemployed. But then there's another production company that's starting their film, and so labor is kind of moving around. Labor is churning within the cluster. Okay. What's the expected profit? Would it be the average of the two? Uh, why? Might be. If you can give me a little more meat on the bones. So both outcomes are equally likely? Both outcomes are equally likely. That's the assumption. So yes, I'm holding that the same. So then it would be the average of the two. So what do you got? <clears throat> One twenty. Pull out your pencils here. And might as well put your brains to work here. We got triangle. Which triangle are we? Are we editing this out? Or are we taking the whole thing? What are we doing here mathematically? It's the whole thing. It's the whole thing. Because during high demand, I hire twenty-one workers, right? And my profit triangle would be that whole thing. 14 times 21, 21 divided by 2 because it's a triangle. One half base time tight. What would you get? 147. 147. And what about over here? Is it positive or negative? positive right we're still making some money we just had a times are tough I, I could drop my labor force down I'm still making a little bit of a profit here but that's the variability of the profit is that I've got two times three is six divided by two is three three plus 147 is answer is 75 because we're averaging, we're having it equally likely that I'm gonna have a suck year or a good year. And so if that's my odds, then I've got expected profits of 75. Yeah. So benefits to clustering or no benefits to clustering? Benefits. Benefits to clustering. So by having the clustering, I'm able to 
reduce my labor force at a fixed price rather than having to be forced to change the wages uh, for each uh, time there's a high demand or low demand. So by having this dynamic thing of some firms doing well, some not, if it's a volatile industry, there's advantages to clustering. Then we can, it'll soften the blow having this big labor pool that we're drawing from. So what, mortgages? Mortgage yeah, that could be, could be in mortgage industry. All right, um, quick little exercise. This kind of goes back to, this is number three in the back of the chapter exercises. Just to kind of get, get us thinking, it relates, it relates to the, Oops, did I not do that? Oh, four, eight. oh no, I gave cadence first, that's right. All right, so why don't you guys chew on that one? Did I not have enough? I guess I didn't. No, I don't. Why don't you, uh, Punch over with Adam there. I'm going to go run the copy. I guess I did go short. I can use my book. Should not say it. Yeah. That, oh, yeah. If you got your book, it's the same thing. Except you don't have the figure. So you might have to look over at it's. Well, I can put that on the board. It's this one. So this is the picture that you have there. So is this isolated cluster wage workforce wage workforce good times? Uh, that is the table. That's an that's an error. Yeah, that was a cut and paste error. So you can cross that part off. It's it's the table that's below. Okay. Good. I'll come around and start. Oh, we don't need the table. No, you need the table, but this little extra garbage of. supposed to use a figure like 3-2 or 3-3? Three, three. Because that's, that's what applies to this kind of stuff. 3-2 is the bottom. Yeah, 3-2 is the bottom. That's this one. Yeah. Figure 3-2. It's the one I, I've got up on the screen. I just have it there for reference. We're supposed to draw a different one, you're saying? To illustrate Use a figure like 3-2 to illustrate this situation with this information. So we got wages, clustered, workforce. So you want three graphs here or one? Um, I guess put down what you think is what you need. Some of them are the bottom two are a little bit of a replication. You know that you are right. Yeah. That is that is the wrong panel. Yeah, it's the one we just did. But they, it's a typo in the book. Max, doesn't the book say I figured 3-2? Yeah. Yeah. So it's this one. I can't put both of them on the screen at once, but it's the one we just went through where they got the high demand, the low demand. And then you got the average of the two. 